Thank you, Avis, and good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I know there are people there. I can see you. Um, so first of all, let me just say um, I'm honored to be asked to be part of this conversation, um, which for those of you who don't know is an extension of a conversation now that's been going on for about a decade, uh, funded by the Ford Foundation and supported um, with the um, uh, Global uh, Policy Solutions as well as the Insight Center for Community Economic Development. Um, it's been an extraordinary journey for us. And one of the more um, interesting things is that uh, it, we've had two extreme outcomes. So the first outcome is that we've been able to organize our work and network with one another and better develop uh, research, as you heard some of earlier this morning. And the flip side of it is the problem that we were addressing, the wealth gap, has actually doubled since we started meeting. Now, I'm hoping that our meetings had nothing to do with the doubling of the wealth gap. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to go through a few slides very, very quickly around the whole housing market. My goal is not to get into details on any issue. Uh, I have a lot of slides. Um, you'll notice I'm not controlling the slides. I'll have to say next slide. I think they did that. Uh, so if Ed and I take too much time on our slides, they'll just start flipping them uh, when they're ready. Um, but my goal, again, is to give sort of a big picture understanding of where we've been through the crisis and where we're going now. So I'll start with the first slide. And the first slide should say wealth effects of the Great Recession. Yes. And uh, assuming that's what it says, what you will see there is work done by the Pew uh, Research Center that I believe was alluded to earlier by Derek uh, that showed that um, uh, the extraordinary wealth loss by people of color, um, uh, Latinos lost roughly um, uh, two thirds of their wealth, 66%. African-Americans, 53 percent, and uh, Asians, 54 percent. So of course, the big question is, are we recovering? So let's go to the next slide. And as you can see, uh, just looking at African-Americans and Latinos together, we constitute just under 30 percent of the population. But if you're looking at conventional loan uh, approved applications, we're less than 7 percent. So I think it's fair to say that we're not recovering. And in fact, Tom's work uh, earlier this morning, he talked about the fact that um, some of the work that they recently done, as well as Derek pointed out, no, we are not yet recovering from the Great Recession. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and one of the reasons I think that we're not recovering is the misaligned goals of housing finance legislation relative to the pre-crisis housing market problems. Oh, that's not the slide we're on. We're on problems contributing. Uh, so um, as you'll see, the, the problems, and these are my perspective of the problems. Many people may have different views. But we had a market saturation of high-risk loans. We had profit-maximizing business models uh, for business that's long-term. So you've got long-term loans, 30-year loans, but, but in fact, um, uh, shareholders demanding quarterly earnings uh, records every quarter. Uh, we had an implicit federal guarantee, not only of Fannie and Freddie, but the entire uh, housing finance system, and in fact, ultimately, the entire U.S. financial system. And we had insufficient safe and sustainable loan products for the full range of borrowers in our society. And actually, the number one, uh, the number uh, five issue there really is the reason we had all this market saturation with high-risk loans, because we weren't serving this uh, population very well. And so by in that void came all of the subprime 228s, 327s, and other loan products. When we go forward to look at the um, uh, remaking the housing market, that would be the next slide, misaligned goals of housing finance, you'll notice that the most often repeated statement in Washington about what the housing finance system has to do is increase private capital and mortgage finance. Now, there's also, you know, have an explicit federal guarantee uh, and improve uh, financial firms' capital positions. Those are really important, but the number one is increase uh, private capital. What's missing as the number one goal, in my view, is the number one goal that we should be looking at, which is how do we provide a broad range of safe and sustainable loan products and services to meet the diverse needs of consumers based on their income assets, credit behaviors, and geographies. So let's go to the next slide, which I have no idea what it is. <laughs> protect American taxpayers. So protecting American taxpayers. So. Um, 
So when you look at the major pieces of legislation in the, you know, on the House side, you'll see legislation that's uh, protecting American taxpayers and homeowners act. And that was introduced by Jeb Henserling. And basically that's an ideologically driven bill, which basically says the private market can do it and it can do it all. So it, it all but eliminates uh, the entire role of the, uh, the federal government in housing finance with the exception of a modest role for FHA. And the problem with this is that it's ideologically driven, not analytically driven. And so the, the bottom line of that bill is that in all likelihood, it would diminish significantly the 30-year fixed rate uh, mortgage, uh, would, would drop maybe from about 75% to maybe 20%, could even be less. Uh, down payments would likely exceed 20%. It would probably eliminate the to-be-announced market that allows you to lock in your interest rate um, you know, when you apply for a loan. Uh, between the time you apply and the time to closing. Um, it doesn't really address the multifamily financing aspects of Fannie and Freddie. But the real thing about this bill is that the last time the U.S. had a fully private housing finance system was in the years leading up to the Great Depression. And we saw where that got us. We had balloon loans, down payments exceeding 50 percent. And the whole federal infrastructure from FHA, the federal home loan banks, and the uh, uh, creation of Fannie Mae were all uh, put into place to address the inherent weaknesses of a private market. And I might add that right now, uh, private label securities for uh, housing practically do not exist. The next bill, the next bill, okay, is uh, the Housing Finance GSE Reform Bill, Johnson Crapo. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, energy around that this week. Um, it is a, uh, in my estimation, in terms of actually addressing the affordable needs of the American public, a much better basic infrastructure of design. It has market-based pricing incentive structure to encourage credit to eligible underserved borrowers. It has a greatly expanded funding for the National Housing Trust. I won't go through all the key attributes. I'll just say it's got a lot of them. Let's go to the next slide. So you see more positives of Johnson Crapo. And so when you're looking at the headlines in Johnson Crapo, it does a lot. And I believe Mitria will probably talk more about that bill. So I'll just skip to the next slide that says drawbacks. The drawbacks is that no matter how you turn it, it further restricts lending by requiring all loans to meet a QM standard plus a 3.5 or 5% down payment, which means ultimately at the end of the day, um, more people of color are going to be excluded from the market. In addition, because of the capital levels that are required, it's going to raise um, interest rates. So from about 40 basis points on the low end to uh, 200 basis points or above. Um, I'm, again, I'm not going to go into the, all of the weaknesses because I know others will want to talk about it. But let's go to the next slide. So the next slide just says, here's the bottom line. At the end of the day, as good as Johnson Crapo is, it's going to increase mortgage interest rates. And depending on whose estimates and what the assumptions are, and I can talk about those if you like, interest rates will go up. So here's the fundamental question. What does the American home buying public get for increasing interest rates? And that, I think, is the big uh, unanswered question. No matter how you turn it, interest rates will go up from what's being considered housing finance reform. So what do we get? So what's the next slide? The irony of the focus on increasing private capital is that private capital, lack of private capital, was not the problem preceding the foreclosure crisis. In fact, it was too much of the wrong type of private capital. And so we had flooding of the market through private label secure, securitization that rose from about 22% to 56% of the market. And roughly 85% of those high-risk subprime loans that were securitized were securitized uh, by private label securitization. This is not to say, and I'm not in any way suggesting, that private capital doesn't belong in the housing finance system. Of course it does. The, the point, however, is that restructuring the housing finance system should not start with the question of how do we make sure that private firms make more money while increasing interest rates for the home buying public? The question should be flipped on its head. What does the housing finance system need to do going forward? And then, next slide. I'll just continue. 
<laughs> regardless of what that slide says. And then how do we create a system and in what way do we bring private capital to the market to serve those needs? So one of the things that, that I'll point out is that this slide is saying that the current lack of borrowers of color are contributing to some significant market woes for the housing market. So if we look at um, loans to African Americans, going all the way back to 2001, not to 2006 or 7, which was the height of the bubble, but 2001, which was a more normal year, according to estimates of the Urban Institute, uh, purchase originations are down by 55% and 45% for African Americans and Latinos. And you can see for the statistics, I won't go through all of those, that the housing market is struggling in a number of ways. And so, and going to Tom's point about the growth of people of color, already babies of color now are the majority of the U.S. population. If these data on this slide look bad now, when we're talking about seven of 10 net new household formations, think of what it's going to be when people of color are the majority population of America. Where will the housing market be? Where will the housing finance system be? Where will the U.S. financial system be? And where will the U.S. economy be? When you consider that housing and housing services is roughly 15 to 18 percent of GDP in a healthy market. Let's go to the next slide. I just love that quote, but we'll skip it. What's the next slide? OK. So to wrap up, I think this is a close to wrap up uh, slide. As I said before, we should start with the question, what do we need the housing finance system to do? And then how do we do things like make sure we've got adequate uh, capital, that the federal government is paying for an explicit guarantee so that we don't have an implicit guarantee, which, by the way, I'll go back to the PATH Act. Without any explicit federal guarantee, you would be right, right back to where we were before the collapse, where private institutions will make a lot of money in the housing finance system, even though they'll be serving a much smaller share of the market. But if they present a systemic risk as a result of a severe economic downturn, the federal government will step in to bail them out again. That's the problem with not having a fully paid for explicit federal guarantee. So we should have that. And then the final piece on capital is that we should have a full exploration of the most appropriate manner to engage private capital. It might be private uh, profit maximizing firms, but we might also have a cooperative model or we may have a utility model. And so my point is that on Capitol Hill, we're not really considering those models, and we should be. There's no reason they should not be on the table. And the last slide is housing finance reform via the Federal Housing Finance Agency. As Congressman Cummings pointed out, the agency, FHFA, now has its first permanent director under Mel Watt, who is an extremely knowledgeable and engaging individual. Here is the, the reality for this summit and uh, the issue of the racial wealth gap. The FHFA has the authority right now to put into place the practices and the loan products and the services to expand the credit box and bring people of color, low and moderate income households, young families into home ownership. That authority rests with the FHFA, and if you're looking at my slide, you'll see I list five major points of things that the FHFA could do. We need to focus on the FHFA because even if the perfect bill were going through Congress right now, it would take roughly five years to put that new system into place. That would be five years in which people of color are still excluded from the housing market. And so right now, there's no reason that FHFA isn't actively and aggressively and assertively changing the practices of Fannie and Freddie post-conservatorship, because we're out of that, and actually making home ownership a reality for people of color, for low wealth and low income individuals. And if we do both of those, we explore what the system should do through legislation while fixing the system now through FHFA, we could take the time that's necessary and not try and rush through a piece of legislation that simply figures out more ways to help private firms make more money, but instead take the time and create a system that works for America while making the system work for America now. Thank you. Great. Thank you.